Hi, Stuart here, and today we're going to deep dive into a pattern called pacing, or how to deal with sending messages to syncs with limits. Let's just imagine that you've got this beautiful, delightful enterprise system. It's high scale, it's great, but there's this API out in the universe that you have to send messages to. And unfortunately, it can't cope with sending messages too quickly. If you do that, it falls over, explodes, or loses your messages, or something else horrible. And the other problem is, is that it can't really deal with you sending too many messages at the same time. And so the way that we typically tackle that is we want to stagger our sends to them in a, just the right way so that we can through a little tuning, figure out how many messages we can send at once. And actually, the pacing pattern ends up in each of the messages going off to the other system as being slightly distributed in time. They have sort of soft offsets from each other. And that's great because if you have a unit of work and it takes n amount of time, then if we have, we, you know, we start that unit of work and at the end of that unit of work, we, you know, send our message off and then update some status, right? That's pretty typical. We do some pre-processing, we send the message, we do some post-processing. So if we can slightly offset the starts of units of work, so let's say we have a system fed by a queue, and then we have a scale set of queue consumers, right? And we can set how many, what the minimum maximum are in the scale set. And obviously we want N to be greater than one because if one of them gives up the ghost or is busy or whatever, we want a uh, high availability, right? So we have two things that we can basically tune. One is the number of workers, too many, and they're just not being kept busy and it's not economical or reasonable, too few, and, you know, messages are queuing up too quickly, although that may happen if, for example, the sync you're trying to send to, that third-party service, can take way less messages, right, than are queued up. But the great thing about matching queuing with pacing is, is that we can distribute messages in time. So let's say our business process is super busy for like six hours during the core of the business day. But their API is available 24-7. Well, we can take the gazillion messages that we generate in that six hours and the, the few that trail it and the few that precede it, and we can distribute them in time effectively. And if the at the end of one time cycle, 24 hours, we've processed all of the man the messages. In other words, the message queue goes from being empty to fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller, and then it starts to empty again. And it and we don't have much in the way of what's called lag. That is, a message from yesterday is still around today. Uh, if that scenario happens, by the way, you have to have a chat with the third party and say, look, friends, I really need to send you more messages than are, you know, than, than you can even consume in a day. Can we talk? But if we can, you know, if they say, look, over a 24 hour period, we can take a hundred thousand requests. Would you mind just distributing them in, in time over that 24 hours at an even rate, e.g. a pace? will happily consume your messages, right? So you gotta kinda watch that. So we can tune the number of instances and we can tune the interval between we start new units of work. So if a unit of work takes say one second and they can handle say two messages a second, then we could set our pacing interval to roughly half of a second. And, you know, we'd, we'd end up with about two but in reality, you know, processing takes variable amounts of time based on resources and message size and stuff like that. So here is our kind of desired flow, right? It's very hard to implement pacing without some sort of queue. And it doesn't have to be a queue queue like Azure Service Bus or Rabbit. It could be records in a table, right? It could be files in a blob store or whatever, but you need to be able to store up 
the torrent of things to do from your business processes somewhere. Now I'm going to use a QQ because, you know, that's a typical enterprise scenario. And my consumers here are functions. And of course, the, the purpose of the function is to do the pre-processing, sending the message and post-processing and to, to dispatch those off to our third party process. So this is what we'd like to do. But the problem is, is if we hammer that third party, right, with too many messages, again, bad things happen. So we've got to tweak that a little bit. So here's the basic message flow, right, where we start with the message coming in and our functions activated by the incoming message. So if you're using Azure Functions or AWS Lambdas or whatever, this is kind of how it works. We test for well, if the message is well formed. Uh, sometimes, you know, bad messages end up in our message store and, and, and we need to have a, pr a process for that. And so we, you know, we need to, to deal with that. But if the message is well formed, then we need to do our pre-processing. We need to send the message. If we have success, then we can go back to being idle until our next message. If we have failure, we go, well, was that? because the host wasn't really ready for it and it's it's going to be resendable or did the host reject the message as being badly formed because just because we think it's well formed doesn't necessarily mean that they do right so if we got a some sort of a 400 error back from them that says you know there's just something uh, semantically or syntactically wrong with your message then we you know we loop back around to the bad message queue but if they said you know what we got a 429, our gateway's too busy. We got, you know, uh, uh, 500, you know, site unavailable, whatever. We're just gonna requeue the message. And that's fine for kind of the, 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 the business flow for inside your enterprise where you control the scaling and you control the number of instances. And you can kind of, and if you have auto scaling turned on, you can tune and whatever. But if you have, you know, auto scaling, especially, or if you just have a large number of instances capable of trying to call that third party API, then the, the problem is, again, you can just hammer them to death. So we need a new strategy. So our strategy is we need to introduce a little piece of state machine. And for this demo, I'm using Redis. And you'll see when we look at the code in the demo, that what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well, for each different kind of message, I'm going to have a key in Redis with a date timestamp. And every time that I go and DQ a message, I'm going to ask Redis to bring me back that key with a date timestamp. And if it's after the period of the date timestamp, right, if it's later than the date timestamp than we wrote to Redis, or it's missing altogether, right? Because we've, we've just started the process and there's no key written. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and do my unit. On the other hand, if the uh, right now is before the pacing interval, right? So the pacing interval is a minute and a half from now. I'm going to put the message back on the queue. And that's the basic idea for pacing. And at the end of each unit of work, you know, if we say, okay, well, I am going to do a unit of work. We reset the pacing and that allows multiple consumers to then execute that same logic. So, you know, we're going to, the net effect of that is we're going to spread messages out in time by requeuing any messages that are in fact not ready to process. And again, if we're using a database, then we wouldn't change the is ready to send status. If we have a blob store, we, you know, we wouldn't delete the message, right? If we successfully send, we might delete the file or move it somewhere else. It doesn't matter what our process is. Again, I'm using a queue because that's an easy to understand analogy. And so the paste message flow, right? We're going to insert pacing into this. And so, you know, again, we're checking that timestamp to see if it's sendable and we're updating the timestamp if it is. And the, the end result of that is that we're going to end up distributing those messages over time. Now, that's hard to visualize off of PowerPoint. So here's a little example. So the black lines represent the pacing interval, and the green lines represent the execution of one unit of work from start to stop. So if the average or maximum execution time for a unit of work is less than the pacing interval, the upshot of this is 
we will be sending, no matter how many uh, workers we have, right, consuming the message queue and trying to send to the third party, we're going to be sending messages one at a time. And the advantage to this is that if if our pacing, our unit of work, say, takes on average one second and our pacing interval is two seconds, but that still results in way too many messages being sent too close together to the third party, we can make that pacing interval three seconds or four seconds, right? Until we consistently can successfully deliver good messages to the third party. The flip side to that, right, is the pacing interval is actually smaller than the maximum duration of the unit of work. And so the upshot of this is that we have more than one message in flight at once. And so by the other thing that this shows is that the unit of work time is not, typically speaking, a constant, right? You know, if I have a small message or the pre-processing goes really quick or, you know, I have, I have backing services like a database I'm checking against or a file store or a, a queue or whatever, right? The time to interact with those is going to vary. And remember, we're talking about milliseconds here in the main. And so consequently, our execution intervals, even for the same message, we took exactly the same message and we ran it through a gazillion times, they would converge on some mean, but they would have some number of standard deviations of difference. And so this is very real, right? That we have execution times of different durations. But the important thing is, if the pacing interval is less than the maximum duration, then we're going to be allowing our worker to execute a message instead of putting it back on the queue while somebody else is already kind of mid-processing. And so, you know, this is overlapping. And so if our third, if it turns out that we're sending them kind of in onesies and they from different agents, right, in kind of random rotation based on who's activated at what time, they come back and say, well, you know, you can send them to us a little quicker. You can start slowly ratcheting down the pacing interval until they say, whoa, that's about the right pace, or wait, that's way too quick, and then you ratchet it back up again, right? So you can tune the pacing interval until you get a sort of a happy third-party thing. And you can implement pacing with more sophistication than that, because if you time the execution time and the output status, right, you could write yourself a little algorithm that dynamically tweaks the pacing interval, but that's pretty advanced. And it turns out usually it's more trouble than it's worth. But for example, you could use that for a back off scenario. So let's suppose that at some point your management logging and awareness level notices that like every message that's being dequeued is being requeued again, right? That the host is just hosed. Then what you could do is you could use exponential back off of the pacing interval by writing a bigger pace interval to your shared state, which in this case, again, I'm using Redis. And you could, and then everybody would just stop trying to send things for a while. And then the first one that uh, tries again will try to send one message because our back off time is way longer than our maximum execution time. And if that one succeeds, and the one after that and the one after that, after some threshold, you could reset the pacing interval to the default again. And so you could actually use this as a resiliency trick as well. Okay, here's our Visual Studio. And the first thing to note is that my Docker desktop is up and running. And so I can start my Redis container that I use in my uh, demonstration in the default shell. Now I can go ahead and look at the pacing library. So the pacing library is built on top of the Redis client and I have a different video on the Redis client. So we're just going to assume that you know about Redis and I want to show you the two parts of the algorithm. One is called runnable and the other is called mark pacing. Runnable by default is false and we put in a key suffix. So we have, we make a key in Redis with a key prefix and a key suffix. A uh, key prefix is used for the name of your application. So if you're sharing a Redis uh, amongst a bunch of 
uh, different applications. You can uniquely separate out your keys. That's what key prefix is for. And key suffix is typically used in these scenarios for the message type that you're processing. And so the combination of prefix and suffix is my application for this message type. And so we go ahead and glue the key suffix to the key prefix. And we say, hey, Redis client, go get me the date time at this key. And we say, okay, well, if the date and time is less than UTC now, I use UTC everywhere when I use dates in C sharp, and so should you. Then we say is runnable is equal to true. That's it. That's as complicated as it is, right? We're just storing one row in Redis for every application, for every type of message we want to process. So that's runnable. The other part to this is marking the pacing. And so we say, okay, we're going to pass in our key suffix again, except this time we're going to tell it what we want the pacing interval to be. And we're going to pass it into this explicitly because you may want to have a variable pacing scenario. And so we accommodate that by making that available. And what are we doing? We're going to make our Redis key. And then down here at 93, we're going to go ahead and compute from the time span we passed in when the next time that something is runnable. And we're going to call our Redis client call set on a, with a type of date time with the key and the resulting date. And that's really all there is to it, right? We're reading and writing a key of type date time from Redis. Now the Redis Underneath the covers, the Redis library is doing lots of interesting things. And in fact, mine is built on top of the excellent Stack Exchange library, but I wanted just a little helper to make my life easier. In our unit tests, I like unit tests as a demo vehicle because you can step through them and you get all the advantages of the testing library and so forth. And so let's take a look at the unit tests for just making sure that our pacing is working. So in this case, we want to create our agent passing in our Redis configuration and key prefix. And we're going to make sure that our agent is valid. Valid is just checking to make sure that we have a valid Redis connection and that we've supplied a key prefix and things like that. We're going to create a time span, which is our pacing interval. And we're going to call mark pacing to set the initial value. And then we're going to sleep. And then we're going to see if the thing is runnable. Let's go ahead and run this unit test and confirm to ourselves that that's a happy making scenario. And you can see that our test passed. So we want to test the contrary case too, where we are setting our time span to be much, much bigger than the running. And in this case, we're not even going to sleep. We're going to go ahead and just immediately see if it's runnable. And of course, this should return false. So let's run this. And in fact, that's true as well. So between these two tests, we know that our pacing fundamentally is working. So that's a good thing. And so we want to then be able to sort of simulate uh, what the uh, different use cases with different pacing is. And so I have a pacing simulator and you can go ahead and break that open and take a look at it. But fundamentally, each different pacing experiment sets a minimum processing and maximum processing seconds for our unit of work, how many messages we want, and what our pacing interval is in milliseconds. And then we call the simulator and we see what happens. And so I have a couple of different riffs on that so that I can try to see what happens. And so if you run this, it will happily run the simulator with those parameters. And we can go over to our test explorer and we can pick on the pacing simulation we, we did. And you can see that in this case, we are averaging between two and three active simultaneous jobs, but slightly notice the timestamps, they're slightly offset from each other. And that's excellent, right? Because the first task that we started is probably well on the way to sending the message, but the second task may be still doing its pre-processing logic or whatever. So, you know, this is 
as we loop through this thing, you can see that we're kind of averaging two to three simultaneous ones. There's a four. Um, and you can see that uh, as they come to the end of their units of work. Now, why are, are these not all exactly the same? Well, they're not all exactly the same because, again, we set a range. So here we have a range. So the unit of work takes between 100 milliseconds and 1,000 milliseconds or one second. So if you want to see what happens when the uh, unit of work is a constant, and again, not a good simulation because it almost never happens, but you can start to make the interval between the minimum unit of work time and the maximum unit of work time different. And also, in this case, we're going to play with the pacing. So we'll go ahead and run this, and then we'll see what the resulting pacing looks like. And again, we can go click on our unit test, and you can see that on average, we're getting a lot more simultaneous jobs, but it kind of ebbs and flows between three and five, depending on how long each unit of work takes. And then lastly, in this example, we have a very, very long pacing that exceeds the length of the maximum processing. And so what we'd expect is at most two, but more typically one unit, one message being sent at any one time. And this is that case where we, we are pacing at one message at a time and we're growing the interval milliseconds until the third party we're sending to stops saying, ow, 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 ow. Um, you're sending them too quickly. And you can see that, in fact, done active, done active, done active, done active, right? We have one simultaneous message, and you can see from the intervals that they're spaced in time, right? And the more severe I make the pacing milliseconds above the unit of work, the more we're giving that third-party system a chance in between messages to compensate. So there is the pacing algorithm. You can go ahead and borrow my algorithm. It's MIT licensed. You can make your own algorithm from my algorithm. Uh, you can play with the unit tests, and it's all available up on my GitHub.